lots of space and time is given by newspapers and television to reviewing and revisiting the great events of the, the past 12 months. I'm sure you've already seen some of them. You'll hear more uh, about them. What were the, the really significant occurrences politically, economically, socially, worldwide, nationally, even, even locally, that made the so-called big headlines, depending, of, of course, upon who declares them to be big, and, and maybe you don't in that situation. But here are some that I picked out. Had probably the, the, the major headline, the re-election of President Barack H. Obama. 44th President of the United States, first African-American president, re-elected to a second term. Clearly the top story. Now, there are some that are a little more... Um, difficult to deal with. That's quite positive and, and uplifting. There were some that weren't, like Hurricane Sandy, which swept along the East Coast on October 29th, left uh, 128 people dead and $71 billion worth of damage. There was the spike in gas prices. Remember that? Spike in gas prices at the pump dropped a little bit in December, but the month began with a national average of $3.40 a gallon. I'm glad they're a little, it's a little less over in our part of the country. In international events, who could forget the September 11th attack again on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, killing the U.S. ambassador over there named Christopher Stevens, along with three other Americans. In judicial matters, we're reminded and horrified, scandalized, at both the Trayvon Martin slaying as well as the Jerry Sandusky trial. And perhaps most tragically of all remains the indescribable heartache that took place in Newtown, Connecticut, where 27 people, including 18 young children, were shot to death inside the Sandy Hook Elementary School. What you may not know is that was not the first or second or even third mass shooting in the United States in 2012. There were 16 mass shootings in the United States, leaving a total, as of right now, of 84 that have been killed. Notable deaths in 2012 included probably the most accomplished singer of all time, Whitney Houston. Country, charming actor Andy Griffith. The first American woman in space, Sally Ride. The first astronaut to land on the moon back in 1969, Neil Armstrong. The winningest football coach in NCAA history, Joe Paterno. Later disgraced, of course, through his association with the Sandusky trial. The oldest living teenager died. You know his name? Dick Clark. Watergate notorious Watergate personality who turned prison minister, Chuck Colson, died in 2012. The gentleman that, that wrote the book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey, died in 2012. Daryl Royal, former football coach at the University of Texas, died in 2012. And Senator Daniel Inouye, who lost his right arm fighting for his country during World War II and later represented his state of Hawaii for 50 years in the United States Senate, died. And, of course, we have family home this weekend, and we were reminded that uh, one more San Antonio legend passed away in 2012, Chris Madrid of Chris Madrid's Hamburgers. We like those places. Most of us realize that the new year that's coming up is essentially a deposit of time. The time has been loaned to us from the Lord to the world's inhabitants. And as far as I can tell, there are absolutely no guarantees with that time whatsoever. I'm certain you've already heard this, maybe have already calculated it, but if you haven't, 2013 is going to bring with it 365 days. And it is going to be chocked full with 8,760 hours, 525,600 minutes, and 
536,000 seconds. And every one of those is vitally important. You know why? It's all you got. You cannot manufacture another second. You cannot bring up another minute. And that's assuming that you have all of them. You may not get all of them. But if you have those times, if you have all of 2013, that's all the time that you're going to have. Chuck Swindoll calls time an elusive, irretrievable phantom. Gratefully, at least I hope you are, we have a little time on our hands this morning. As we sit here in worship of the Lord and listen to the music, pray our prayers, and hear His Word. But if God gives us all of the seconds, all of the minutes, all of the days and weeks and months of 2013 that we sit here right now saying, oh yeah, we'll, we'll get it, sure, it's no, no problem. We got all of 2011 and 12, so there's no problem with getting that. The question is still the same. What are you going to do with all that time? What will you do with it? I suggest there's one of two things you can do. You can either waste them or invest them. That's about the only things we can do with the seconds and the minutes and the weeks and the months that God gives us. We can waste time or we can invest our time. I ask you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, we're going to look at just one little phrase this morning uh, that is found over in chapter or uh, verse 16 of chapter 5, but to give a little bit more of a, of a, a softer and stronger perhaps reading, I'm going to do uh, read chapter 5, verse 15 and 16 as well. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Now, that's not a reference to picking up one foot and putting it down and all that stuff, but the way you live your life is the better understanding of it. Be careful how you walk in the, the ways of, of life. Not as unwise men, but as wise. He's talking to Christians. Making the most of your time. That's the phrase. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. The days in which you live are evil. So what is he saying to us all this morning? If you're a Christian, if you know the Lord is your Savior, you need to make the most of every second that God gives you in the year 2013. To make the most of every opportunity, do not squander one of those 565, 525,600 minutes. Not a one of them. Do everything you can to make the most of your time, to invest your time in the best possible way. In Shakespeare's Richard II, the imprisoned king declares only moments before his death, I wasted time, now time doth waste me. If you waste your time, you will find that you can't get it back. Time will have wasted everything about you as well. For a, a more contemporary twist on that theme, here's something I found from Kay Lyons. Yesterday is a canceled check. Tomorrow is a promissory note. Today is the only cash you have. So spend it wisely. You can't count on tomorrow. And yesterday's gone. Right now is all you have. Make the most of every second that you draw breath. Now, I know you're going to, to thank me for saying this, but you're not going to spend all of your 2013 here in this service listening to me. Well, I thought I'd get another amen or two out of that. But, uh, <laughs> so, for the time that we have, which won't be long, let's... Um, Redeem this time, as the King James Version talks about. Let's make the most of the 30 minutes or so we have remaining here in our service. Looking, not, not looking back on 2012. I, I'm going to let the, the media types do that sort of thing and tell you everything there is to know uh, about that. But rather, in a personal examination, that hopefully will help us to face up to what lies ahead in 2013. So with apologies to Socrates, 
who once famously stated, the unexamined life is not worth living. Let's turn instead to the examined life. Let's see what our life would look like if we took some time to examine it. And I'll do that in three easy-to-write-down steps. The first one is this. Take an accurate spiritual inventory. Take an accurate spiritual inventory. How many of you have been involved in taking uh, an inventory at either the store or the plant that you work at or have worked at in, at one time? Let me see your hands. You've done an inventory. Now, don't you love year end-of-the-year inventories? Yeah, I, I didn't either. Uh, my first one, and as I think about it, my only one, was with U.S. Brass Corporation, which was located in Plano, Texas, way back in the Dark Ages in 1968, before they had computers. And you had to write stuff down, literally, back in those days. U.S. Brass manufactured uh, brass fittings and valves, that kind of thing, for wholesale plumbing supplies. And so we would pack those things up and send them off to a wholesale plumber who would in turn sell it to a retail plumber, and it would eventually wind up in your house. I worked there at U.S. Brass for a couple of summers, and following my senior year in high school, I went back to U.S. Brass over the uh, college uh, holiday break, similar to, to what we have now. Well, to my great surprise, when I got there, they put me in charge. Yes, I'm, I'm like 18, 19 years old, but they put me in charge of six to eight just grisly old guys that worked out there in the machine shop. You ever worked in a machine shop? And th th those guys can be kind of, yeah, they can be grisly. You know, if they, is that a good term? Not, not, not all of them, not all of them are, but some of them certainly uh, can be. Now, those guys could turn out high quality brass compression and flare fittings. Man, they could do that, with, and they were gorgeous, shiny, pretty. But they didn't know the first thing about the valves. And we also sold valves. We didn't make them there, but we brought them in and then shipped them out. They didn't know anything at all about valves and their, their catalog numbers and, and that sort of thing. And that's where the kid from Princeton, Texas, came in. They put me in charge of that. I'd worked all summer with those valves. I knew what they looked like, what the part numbers were. I'd shipped enough of them and counted enough of them that I understood those kinds of things. So my men and I, if you can believe that, were responsible for locating every brass valve in the place. You had to count them. You had to take a pencil back in those days and literally write the number down on a card and attach the card to a box if there was enough to put in the box or a bin, those kinds of things. You, you had to record that, that little number. Inventories told management what was on the inside of the store, or in this particular case, the plant. Numbers. That's all they wanted was just a particular number that was written down there. That way they had it. It was the psalmist of Israel who wrote, Search me, O God, know my heart, test me, and know my thoughts. And any time, as the point I raised a moment ago suggests, that we try to take an accurate spiritual inventory, we're asking God to, to begin to do that within our lives. He's the one that's working inside us. And if we invite God to come inside and launch a search or an inventory of our heart and an inventory, uh, inventory of our thoughts, it is absolutely indispensable that we maintain an attitude of integrity on our part. Because, biblically, we're admonished not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And we sometimes do that, don't we? Well, now, I wouldn't do that. And so, Lord, search my heart point out all my shortcomings, but I wouldn't do that, and I would never do that. Really? An accurate inventory is one in which the Lord has allowed free reign within us, and he points out everything that could possibly be bad. It's a, it's a searchlight that is on our hearts. It's the psalmist, again, who gives us another dose of reality when he says this in, in Psalm 19.12, how can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? I ask myself that a lot. 
How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? And then he says in, in the last part of that verse, cleanse me from hidden faults. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Now I, I don't understand that. What do you mean uh, the sins that are hiding out there? Well, it's, it's more than likely that his reference was not so much to sins that he tried to hide from others as much as it was the sins which were actually hidden from him. You ever done that? You ever thought through that? I mean, I, I have been through some times where I thought, I, I have confessed every possible sin in, in, in the world. And then there were some that were hiding, and I didn't even notice it. And it wasn't because I was trying to hide them from you. It just sort of skipped by me. That's what I think he's talking about. Some of these things that we don't even recognize. I'm not sure why we don't recognize it. Maybe we practice it so often that it becomes second nature with us and we don't even recognize that it's a sin. I, I'm not real sure. But I think there are those sins, and, and there are based on what the Scripture is telling us, that kind of hide out inside us, and we're not so sure we even do those sins, that we commit those sins. And so the psalmist is saying, in my integrity, in my honesty, I do not want to deceive myself, Lord. Point them out to me. Expose them to me. That's the accurate spiritual inventory that we're talking about. And just as most of us are probably going to sit down here in a few days and, and, uh, and kind of measure out or, or, or take a, an account of the, the damage from our, shall I say, healthy holiday hunger, you know, we'll, we'll kind of take a look and say, well, I've picked up a few pounds here. I'm going to cut back now and, and get back to where I want to be and that kind of thing. Physically speaking, we're also calling for the same thing with regard to the spiritual side of your lives. To take a measurement of that, take an assessment of that, of your spiritual health, inventory these things, ask the Lord to show you that as it relates to the spiritual life. What's the second step? Carefully analyze your findings. Carefully analyze your findings. After my initial inventory experience, Taking corporate inventory involved really more than just counting valves and, and fittings, I, I found out. You know, it's one thing to count it, set it up on a shelf, mark it, and say there are 30 of them in there and that sort of thing. You walk off and you count the, the, the next batch. But that's not everything that you do. Numbers in and of themselves mean nothing. They have to be analyzed and more importantly, they have to be interpreted according to what you've used in the past, maybe what the current needs are, and what the anticipated needs are for the next year, as well as available capital. You've got to bring all these things together and say, okay, I've got all these fittings. Now, what does that really mean? I would suggest that after you've taken a spiritual inventory of your life, you have to try to analyze and interpret the facts. What are they telling you? What are they telling you about the past? Some of the things you've been involved in. Some of the people that you've dealt with. What are they telling you about your present relationship, both with the Lord and with other people? What are they telling you about those individuals, those friends that you run around with who may or may not be good for you? What are they telling you about your future? and some adjustments that you may need to make in the year 2013 and even beyond. As I thought through that, I, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if, if we could be like basketball teams or football teams in that we could look up and we could see a clock, and that clock tells us how much time we have left. Wouldn't that be cool? No? I don't think so either, but... But I do think they have an advantage there because football teams and basketball teams, now, now baseball's not, baseball could go all day, you know, until somebody scores. But, but football teams and basketball teams can look at a clock and say we got 22 seconds left or a minute and a half or whatever the case might be. And they know what time is left and what they have to adjust or change in order to hopefully come around with a win. Game clock management. 
can contribute to a sweet win or a bitter loss. Some of you may remember what happened uh, back in 2005, not too many years ago, just up the street here in San Marcos at Texas State University. They were playing the University of Northern Iowa in one of their semifinal playoff games before the home folks there, 15,000 people, according to the, to the records there, in San Marcos at Texas State. They're at home. You got it? Home crowd. And the game comes down to the end, and they are tied, or near the end, with uh, one minute and 27 seconds left, and they are tied at 37 points each with the University of Northern Iowa. The Texas State coach at that time was named David Bailiff. And so with a minute and 27 seconds left, the coach decided that his team would take a knee. You all familiar with what that means? And just basically run the clock out, let it go, not going to worry about it. We'll go to overtime. We'll figure out a way to win at that particular point. And so with essentially a minute and a half left to go, uh, they decided they would uh, just let the clock run out. Take a knee. Well, Texas State won the toss, a coin toss, to see who gets the ball in the overtime. And they deferred to Northern Iowa. Northern Iowa marches down, kicks a 25-yard field goal, at that time, of course, giving them a three-point lead. On Texas State's first opportunity to come back in the overtime, their quarterback, whose name was Barrick Neely, threw a pass which was intercepted by Northern Iowa's Matt Tharp on third down, which ended the game. And it gave Northern Iowa then a victory of 40-37 to 37 in overtime. Now, that's the game... But what happened was people began to go, and the sports pundits, uh, sports pundits especially were saying, why didn't you use the minute and a half you had left in regulation? I mean, you, you had the home team, the home crowd here, 15,000 people cheering for you. Why did you settle to go into overtime, do something about it at that particular point? In other words, use the clock to your advantage. That's why I say, wouldn't it be great to have that clock up there? And we know we got 22 years and three months and four seconds left. Oh, wait a minute. What if it starts coming down near a day and a half? How would you feel then? Maybe it's better we don't have a game clock because all we can do is sort of look up and see how much time has elapsed, not how much time we have left. I can look at, at my life and I can go, you know, I've got 62 years on the clock now. Coming up on 63 next year. That's how much time has elapsed. Don't know how much time I have left. Several years? Hope so. But it may only be several months. You, you, you don't know these kinds of things. If we did know how much time was left, maybe we would take to heart the words of Horace Mann, who is often called the father of the American public school system. Listen to this. It's, it's, it's artistic, it's poetic, but it really communicates too. He says, lost yesterday, somewhere between sunrise and sunset, two golden hours, each set with 60 diamond minutes. No reward is offered. They are gone forever. If you waste the time, it's gone forever. You cannot get it back to make it better last year. You can only do what you have now and pray in the future that you will use what God wants you to do and to be the way God wants you to be. And so your analysis that you've done so far, those two points, should bring us up to a third and final point in our life examination as we look forward to 2013. Can anybody guess what, I'm going to, what word I'm going to use here? What verb am I going to use? Resolve. Yeah, New Year's resolutions. Resolve to make a new beginning. That's the third one. Resolve to make a new beginning. 
And yeah, New Year's resolutions come and go and, and that kind of thing. And I don't know that I've ever paid a whole lot of attention to it. I did look up some uh, 2013 New Year's resolutions that people have posted on the, on the Internet. You know, if it's on the Internet, you can believe it. And so here are some that people have posted. And this is my favorite one. Procrastinate more. I, I like that one. There are some, though, that are the more persistent ones that come around all the time. Um, go back to college. Now, I can help you with that one if that's, if that's your, your resolution. Be more positive. Quit smoking. Lose weight. Get out of debt. Yeah, right. And the other one I looked up that I thought was kind of interesting was stop making New Year's resolutions. <laughs> now, that one I, I like too. Some of you read and liked my Facebook post back on Christmas Day where uh, if, if you're not a Facebooker, here's what I put. For anyone who must have a New Year's resolution, embrace this pattern of life regardless of your age for 2013. And I quoted Luke 2.52. Jesus matured in wisdom and years, and in favor with God and people. Let that be your New Year's resolution. Mature in wisdom, because you're going to mature in years regardless. That's going to happen. So mature in wisdom, and do better in getting along with God, your relationship with God, and your relationship with others. That's a good biblical resolution. And then I came across Philippians 3.13, which may have convinced me that the Apostle Paul had the best one. He wrote this, Dear brothers and sisters, I am still not all I should be, but I am focusing all my energies on one thing. Know what he says? Forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. Right about now, this time last year, was not a good time for y'all. It was just not a good time. Forget the past. It is done. It's done. Things have changed. People have moved on. You're here. They're not. I'm not saying forget all about them or drop the pain as though it never happened. Forgetting the past means don't let it occupy every waking moment. So forget the past, but he also says, look forward to what lies ahead. You do that as well. And who knows what the Lord's going to do with the new pastor when he gets here. But be prepared to embrace that vision. And be prepared to go forward as much as possible. Forward. Sounds to me like a New Year's resolution. Except probably it didn't happen at New Year. But Paul was looking forward to something new. That's what the Christian faith is about. It's making something new of that which was old. And he stands in some pretty good company, too. The last book of the, of the Bible, Revelation, in chapter 21, verse 5, says that God will make all things new. Now, that's out in the future. But before that, the psalmist said, uh, in chapter, uh, Psalm 33, verse 3, he wrote about a new song. Isaiah the prophet talked about a new name. Ezekiel uh, identified a new spirit and a new heart, and both Matthew and the author of Hebrews talks about a new covenant. New, 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 new. New years. Let's focus on that which is new and not that which is old. That which is coming, not that which is past. What for you would be an appropriate resolution for the year 2013. Now again, I'm not trying to get into the New Year's resolution business, but I would ask that sometime in the next couple of days that maybe you think about that based on what we've been reading this morning. What would make a good resolution for you, spiritually speaking, as it relates to 2013? And as you turn inward to examine your thoughts, to analyze them, to interpret them, Work on taking what you found and putting it into some sort of solid practice in the year 2013. My prayer for each of you as we wrap up 2012 and next time when we meet, it will be that new year. My prayer for each of you is the one that is, was uttered by John Wesley 
back on January the 1st, 1785, 228 years ago. He wrote this, Whether this be the last year or no, may it be the best year of my life. One additional Wesleyan quote that I think would serve as an outstanding mission statement for 2013 for anybody in this room. Here's what he wrote. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Pretty good mission statement. Let's wrap up 2012 on that note and look forward to 2013 as the Lord may give us breath. Pray with me, please. Father in heaven, thank you for this year. Thank you for all the things that have happened. We pray that um, we would take that accurate spiritual inventory, both personally and as a church, and be willing to move forward, forgetting the past, but concentrating more on the future and what is at hand and what you want to do through the new staff as they come on board, the new pastor, all the things that are, are for sure to happen in 2013, you willing that it would. We pray that um, those that are here this morning as individuals, we would also consider what we need to do in our lives to forget the past and to move forward. We pray that uh, we would sense what your spirit would lead us to do and be careful to be as obedient as we possibly can. Again, for the church, I pray your blessings, that we would do everything we can, as John Wesley reminded us, to do all the good that we possibly can in this neighborhood. For those that are here this morning, as we extend this time of commitment and invitation, we pray for any that might need you as personal savior, that might need to make a recommitment of a life as they can continue to think about the new year and what new thing you might want to do and to forget that old way of life with its, with its nastiness, with its filthiness, even with its goodness that was not good enough as we walk toward you. For those that need to recommit, for those that are looking for a church home, we open our time to you, our commitment to you, and pray that you would lead and direct in every way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.